Are we there yet? How many more hours? Aren't we there yet? Honestly, I wonder how many parents have heard that whining plea on long road trips. I know that was one thing that the Byerly children were not supposed to ask when we were on road trips, and we did plenty of wonderful cross-country trips when us kids were growing up. It was just the question that we weren't supposed to ask, because the answer was, we'll be there when we're there. And that didn't matter if we were driving 70 miles across the prairie or stuck behind trucks in Arkansas. The answer was, we'll be there when we're there and we're all together as a family. Now, I'm not doing a travel video here, so why this introduction? Because we're talking about how the Union Army and the Confederate Army got to Newmarket Battlefield. And for some of the units, they may have been thinking, are we there yet? Will we ever get there? I'm Sarah K. Byerly with Gazette 665, and I invite you to join me for a discussion about how the armies got to the fields of Newmarket, Virginia. Now, in some of my previous videos, I have introduced the commanders of the Union Army and the commanders of the Confederate Army. If you haven't had a chance to see those videos, um, I'd recommend go ahead and watch them. You'll find them on the Battle of Newmarket playlist on Gazette 665's YouTube channel. It will give you some good background information. Now, the Union Army, under General Franz Siegel, had one objective in the Newmarket campaign. Just one. It's almost like the cliched saying that you see on social media. You had one job. They had one job. They had to march up the valley, that's south in the Shenandoah Valley, and get to Stanton, Virginia, which was an important railroad hub. They were supposed to do that in conjunction with a cavalry raid or another movement south. So Siegel had his mission. His army had its mission but they kind of took their time about carrying it out. And that plays a big part in the unfolding of the Battle of Newmarket and the campaign as a whole. Now the Union Army, which Franz Siegel had assembled and he'd been doing some training and reorganizing, they leave the area of Martinsburg, West Virginia on April 29th. And they take a couple of days to march from Martinsburg to Winchester, Virginia. Winchester, Virginia, sits as the gateway city, if you will, into the Shenandoah Valley. It was a town that would change hands approximately 76 times during the American Civil War. So many campaigns began or ended at Winchester. It was a difficult place for civilians to live. Troops marched in and out. The civilians in Winchester see Siegel and his army come through. They do not welcome him with open arms. The majority of civilians who live in Winchester were pro-Southern. Now, Siegel's Union boys started off their campaign with five days of rations in their haversacks, or knapsacks, and they were carrying 60 rounds of ammunition. They were going to war. They had supply wagons, they had a baggage train with them, they even had medical ambulances. Their line of march was long. It was six miles long when they leave and they're on the march to Winchester. So six miles of troops, supplies, ammunition wagons spread out over a road network. Some records point to the fact that it took two hours for Siegel's army to pass one point on the road. So that means if you were standing along one of the roads that they were taking and you saw the head of the column pass, you could sit and have a nice long lunch because it'll be two hours before the entire army has passed by that single point of the observer. Now on May 1st, when Siegel arrives in Winchester, John Breckinridge, who will be the Confederate Army commander at the Battle of Newmarket, was nowhere nearby. However, Breckinridge was getting reports of Siegel's movements from the cavalry commander, John Imboden. Imboden's going to keep an eye on Siegel's column and what Siegel does in the next few days, and he keeps reporting to Breckinridge. Breckinridge is also receiving information from General Robert E. Lee, who eventually gives him the order. 
Lee tells Breckenridge you're going to need to join in Bowdoin in the defense of the Shenandoah Valley. See, Breckenridge was waiting down on the Virginia-Tennessee border area. It's on May 4th that Breckenridge receives orders to join Imboden in the Shenandoah Valley and bring what troops he can to oppose this new Union invasion. Breckenridge is nervous about this. It means dividing his already small force. And he knows that there is another Union invasion coming into his Trans-Allegheny Department. That's going to be the more cavalry type of raid that's coming down through West Virginia aiming for the railroad. So Breckenridge is concerned about dividing his forces, but ultimately he has no choice. The following day, Breckenridge and his staff leave and head north to Stanton, Virginia. They arrive in that centralized town three days later on May 8th. The troops under John Eccles and Gabriel Wharton follow behind. It's over a hundred miles from where the Confederate Army had been gathering their more toward the Virginia-Tennessee border to Stanton, Virginia. Wharton and Eccles' men have to march most of the way, although some of the units do get to use part of the railroad for the final trip into Stanton, Virginia. While Breckenridge is hurrying to make Stanton a rallying point, and Eccles and Wharton begin their march with their units on May 6th, Franz Siegel was taking his own sweet time up in the Winchester area. He had put his men into camp, he was having them do drills, he was hosting grand military reviews. He did not seem in a particular hurry to get down to Stanton, which was his campaign objective. Now it's during this time period that we have some interesting records of Franz Siegel's activities. For example, he was going out and personally inspecting the knapsacks of his soldiers to make sure they didn't have any contraband materials. Now that is being a fine disciplinarian, and in other circumstances, it might even be called exemplary. But Siegel was in the middle of a campaign, or he should have been in the middle of a campaign. He had specific objectives. He was supposed to move as quickly as possible to Stanton, Virginia. That does not include inspecting your soldiers' knapsacks. Another example, and this is where Siegel begins to lose the confidence of his army. He decided to have a mock battle. You could almost think of it as a Civil War reenactment that was happening while the war was still being fought. It's a very strange situation that Siegel comes up with. He decides they're going to have like a war games and he sends his units out into the field and they have certain things that they're supposed to do and it just really doesn't work out well. And in some ways it raises red flags in Siegel's leadership and his staff situation because it's even in this mock battle that there's a communication barrier. Siegel and his staff are speaking in German when they get excited and many of his colonels and other officers are not familiar with that language. One of the units, the 34th Massachusetts, actually gets completely lost in this mock battle and literally have to be rescued. Um, it, is, it is at this point that many of the colonels, regiment leaders under Siegel really begin to lose confidence. At the beginning of the campaign, when he first took command um, back in March, there was this excitement about fighting Mitt Siegel. By the time the mock battle happens, that excitement is worn off and the soldiers and officers are starting to feel some measure of concern. While Siegel was busy working on his organizational skills and these reviews and drills and all of this, there were some Confederates hovering in his rear and flanks who were not idle, and they were more than happy to see Siegel and his army and his wagon trains right where they were. John Mosby and John McNeil had partisan bands of raiders, of cavalrymen, and they were going in and causing a mess. Mosby raided Siegel's wagon trains. This is cause for concern. If Siegel cannot protect his supply lines while he is moving up the valley, that just might be a problem. On May 5th, John McNeil and his partisans went and attacked part of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. 
They manage to capture a train station, they cut the telegraph wires, they capture an eastbound train, they cause havoc. This causes a political problem for Siegel because the leadership on the board of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad want their rail lines to stay open. The union needs those supply lines to stay open. Part of Siegel's job, in addition to getting to Stanton, was to cover and protect the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Siegel is not doing a fantastic job with his objectives. Concerns are being raised in Washington, D.C. about what is he doing, how is he doing it, and is he completely clear on the campaign objectives. Then a situation unfolds which draws Confederate General Imboden and a lot of the Confederate cavalry out of Siegel's front. So Imboden and his cavalry regiments were keeping an eye on Siegel's movements from in front of him in the Shenandoah Valley, so just south of him, keeping an eye on the army. Well, Imboden thought there was a rather large body of Union forces coming in from the west. He goes off to confront that situation, uncovering Siegel's front from this heavy cavalry, conf Confederate cavalry screen that was there. It's on May 9th that Siegel and his army leave the vicinity of Winchester. They manage to go 12 miles, and they make camp near Cedar Creek. The following day, May 10th, Siegel and his army take a little break. Some of the units work on repairing the bridge over Cedar Creek, but it's not a very active day. It's on May 10th that Breckenridge calls out the cadets from Virginia Military Institute. They will be one of the last units that will join his gathered army. Breckenridge is getting ready for battle. The question is going to be, where will it be fought? Back in the northern part of the valley, Siegel and his army continue to be harassed by Confederate cavalry and partisans on their flanks and in their rear. It's on May 11th that Siegel makes a decision. He sends Colonel Boyd and part of the New York cavalry to the east. He sends them into Luray Valley on the east side of Massanutten Mountain. They're supposed to make sure that there's no Confederate forces in Luray Valley and then rejoin the army. The problem was they lost contact with the army. Meanwhile, Siegel sends out some units. They're going to continue the march up the Shenandoah Valley. They reach the town of Woodstock, and at Woodstock they make an important discovery. They found letters at the telegraph office. Well, they weren't really letters. Messages. Messages would probably be a better word to use. They find messages at the telegraph office. And these are messages from John Breckenridge to John Imboden. And it reveals some important news to Siegel. Number one. It revealed that the Confederates were still not sure of Siegel's objective. They were questioning, where is he going, what is he aiming to do? Secondly, it revealed that Breckenridge had gathered several thousand troops at Stanton, Virginia, and he was ready to march north to reinforce Imboden in the defense of the Shenandoah Valley. With this information, Siegel could have made some decisive decisions. He could have realized he needed to move quickly, to reach Stanton. He still might have had to fight a battle at Stanton. Breckenridge had an army by that time, but he could have moved quickly. Breckenridge wasn't quite ready, but Siegel waits. It's unexplainable. The weather was bad, but soldiers can march in rain. They marched in rain in the Shenandoah Valley in plenty of other campaigns. Siegel waits, and he waits, and perhaps some of his soldiers are thinking, when are we going to get there? Well, Siegel might have been waiting, but there was a unit coming to join Breckenridge at Stanton that was not waiting. They were making approximately 20 miles a day. This is the cadets from Virginia Military Institute. The Corps of Cadets is on their way. They receive their orders late on May 10th. They will join Breckenridge at Stanton on May 12th. Last year, we got to record an on-location video clip about their march. 
Here we are with uh, modern Route 11 in the background. Um, this is where the Old Valley Turnpike would have been. Route 11 follows the route of the Turnpike. And we have been tracing the route that the Virginia Military Institute cadets took from Lexington. They would join Confederate General John C. Breckinridge's army. We know that the Corps of Cadets left Lexington, where the Institute is, on May 11th at about 7 a.m. in the morning. They marched 18 miles that first day. It was a hot, dry, dusty day, and a lot of the cadets developed blisters and very sore feet. Um, the post surgeon who was going with them, Robert Lewis Madison, he allowed some of the cadets to ride his horse so that they could get a break along the way. Now, we know that the cadets spent that first night at a place called Midway and it was close to a church. We're still seeing if we can identify the exact location, but it would have been somewhere in this area near where we're standing right now. And that night that they camped at Midway, VMI cadet Edward Tutwiler gave us an account of what happened. He wrote, as we had no tents, we improvised a rude shed built of poles and leaves. There was a fearful thunderstorm. We had camped near a Presbyterian church so we opened a window and climbed through it into the church where we found nice cushions in the pews. We soon slept where many a good follower of Calvin had slept before us. The next morning, May 12th, it was still raining. The Valley Pike had turned into a muddy mess, making marching even more difficult, but still the Corps of Cadets managed to march 18 miles into Stanton before noon and Lieutenant Colonel Ship reported to John C. Breckinridge, letting him know that the Corps of Cadets had arrived as ordered. It's on Friday, May 13th, that Breckinridge moves his army from Stanton. They're moving farther north. And he now has his assembled force that will fight at the Battle of Newmarket. However, he doesn't know it's going to be the Battle of Newmarket yet. However, events were starting to unfold in the vicinity of that town and community that would be marking it as a potential battleground. A cavalry clash occurred at the base of Newmarket Gap on May 13th. Following day, May 14th, advanced units under Colonel Augustus Moore come from Siegel's army. They come to Mount Jackson, which is a river crossing area. They cross the Shenandoah River and they are heading up the Valley Pike toward Newmarket. Now John M. Bowden and his Confederate cavalry work to delay this Union advance. They fight a skirmishing battle that lasts quite a bit of the day. However, the Confederates are not able to hold on to a potential defensive position at Roods Hill, which is just south of that river crossing at Mount Jackson and they start falling back through kind of rolling hills and a few plateaus toward the town. On May 14th, the Confederates actually give up the town of Newmarket. They're not able to hold off Colonel Moore's advance. However, the Confederates establish a defensive line along Shirley's Hill, and this is a good piece of high ground. They think there's a possibility they can at least hold on to it through the night, and they would wait and see, wait and see what Imboden and Breckenridge wanted to do. So, are we there yet? That was my starting theme. By the night of May 14th, pieces of the army were at Newmarket. Now, how the troops actually lined up on the battlefield and got ready for the opening dawn breakfast time, if you will, scenario. And we know it was breakfast time because Wharton's men were eating breakfast. Um, <laughs> that situation we're going to explore in more detail in a following video because I skipped over something. Something that's very important and something that plays into the lining up of the troops as they come into Newmarket. And that was Colonel Boyd and the cavalry fight on May 13th. We'll also talk in more detail about the skirmishing fight that happened on May 14th in our next video. There's one more thing that I'd like to point out before I wrap up this video. My question, are we there yet? Perhaps it's a little bit misleading because when both armies, Union and Confederate, begin this campaign, 
take their first steps in the march. They did not know where this battle would be fought. Siegel, as I've mentioned numerous times in this video, was supposed to go to Stanton. Breckenridge and John and Bowdoin were supposed to protect the Shenandoah Valley. A clash and a battle was inevitable. Skirmishing was bound to happen. But they did not know where there was. So it wasn't like the Union soldiers who left Winchester could say, how many more miles until we get to Newmarket? They didn't know that Newmarket would be the point of the clash. In some ways, they were in a similar situation to the two-year-old in the car seat who has no idea where the next stop is going to be, but is continually asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Where will there be? The answer for the Union and Confederate armies that will clash at Newmarket in the Shenandoah Valley by May 15th, as morning dawned, the answer was yes, we are there. It was there Breckenridge had brought his troops to Newmarket. They had arrived, they were there. However, Siegel and his Union army had not arrived. Only a portion of their command was on the field, other units were en route trying to cover that 21 mile gap between the advance units and the rest of Siegel's army. For Siegel and his Union army, some of those units would spend a lot of May 15th asking, are we there yet? Marching swiftly, trying to get to the place where the cannons were sounding. I hope today's video has given you a new perspective on the New Market campaign, maybe demystified a few points as we looked at how the armies get to New Market. Some marched quickly, others took their time. But ultimately, they arrived and the Battle of New Market happened on May 15th, 1864. We'll be back next week to talk about the cavalry clash that preceded Newmarket Battlefield, and then it will be on to the situation on Shirley's Hill and Manor's Hill on the morning of the battle. Thank you so much for watching this video. It has been fun to talk with you through a camera lens and hopefully add some history and inspiration to your day and week. See you next time, and thanks so much. Bye-bye.